Carol Baskin. Killed her husband, whacked him. Can't convince me that it didn't happen. Fed them to tigers, they snack it. What's happening? Carol Baskin. All right, Tiger Crisis, Episode 3, looking at the Netflix documentary, Tiger King, Murder, Mayhem, and Madness. My name is Dan Frigal, I'm a stand-up comedian. Uh, what we're doing today is going to be uh, highly speculative. Actually, that's, that's a lie. Uh, today's episode is, was literally about uh, the murder of Jack Don Lewis. The episode is called The Secret. And so at the end of Episode 2 of Tiger King, we're looking at this character, um, Carol Baskin. And I can't not say her name like that. Carol Baskin. Uh, and so uh, the end of the thing is is like nine people in a row saying, Car- whatever, Carol probably killed her husband anyway. Um, and so we go on Episode 3, if you binge it like me. And if you're like a normal person, in your head you're going, look, there's no way that Carol killed her husband. And then if you look at like the facts, right, there's no body, there's no weapon, there's no motive, there's just this weird loose thing that like, oh, she must have fed her husband to the tigers, which, look. I love my dog, and even if I hate my wife, there's no way I'm feeding my wife to my favorite creature. So that's like an implausible idea. So you go into it being like, you know what? There's no way that this is true. This is shenanigans. What are we talking about? And then Carol starts talking. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh, this bitch probably did it. I think the worst thing that happened to Carol Baskin was that she was interviewed on this program, if we're being honest, if we're being completely honest. So that's my take. Um, Like Carol comes out of the gate uh, with with just saying shenanigans about past husbands and things like this. And it really makes us look at who Carol is. Like just in this episode alone, there's the I wrote down Carol quotes. I had to throw a potato across the kitchen at my ex-husband to get him away from me. Um. He was going early, early, early to Costa Rica. Uh, I couldn't have run his hand through the grinder, much less a body. It's like you are incriminating yourself uh, over and over and over and over again. All right, so let's start from the beginning. Don, which is this this character, Jack Don Lewis. All we really know about him from this episode and from other episodes is that he's this uh, odd millionaire. uh, That he, uh, let's see, that he... Like, he's randomly a pilot, that he fucks everyone he can, that he goes to Costa Rica once a month. His, even his ex-wife is like, look, he's got multiple women. You're not going to change Jack Don Lewis. Uh, in fact, his first marriage was to a 14-year-old girl. Uh, so we already, we're, look, we're looking at this guy. We're going, look, this guy's obviously not, not a great dude already. So it's not, his wife calls him a sexaholic. He meets Carol when he's uh, 42 and she's 20. Uh, So we start off right out of the gates with Carol's walking along Nebraska, Nebraska Avenue, which I don't know if you've been to Tampa, but I know this now firsthand from all my Tampa people. Nebraska Avenue is where you go to pick up prostitutes. So that's how they meet. Carol's running around upset from her husband, walking around Nebraska Avenue, which if you live in Tampa, you know that that's prostitute alley. So she's either trying to be that or she's trying to, to catch the people that are involved in that. You don't accidentally walk where prostitutes are in any part of where you live. Does that, does that make sense? Like if you know that there's a prostitute section and you're not a prostitute, you don't go hang out there. That's all I'm saying. So she's walking along. This dude like triple loops. She's a hot 20 year old flashing her little booty around. And now I'm extrapolating, <laughs> but she's a 20 year old walking around and now he's on the prowl. And this is the weirdest part. So Carol tells the story where she is pulled up on by Jack Don Lewis. And he says, after the third interaction, he says, look, I have this gun on the front seat of my car. You can hold it on me. I just need someone to talk to. That's the piece of information that Carol that Carol says firsthand. And that was the thing that convinced her to hang out with Jack Don Lewis. That's, that's alarming. Okay, Uh, that's very alarming. 
So then the end of that whole story for her is that she spent the night with him. So she knows he's married. She knows he's married. She knows she's married. And the first date that she has with this dude is a stroll at gunpoint. So right from there, we know that Carol is a psychopath. I had to throw a potato across the kitchen of my ex-husband to get away from him. That's the pre-story for, for linking up with, uh, with Don Lewis, uh, which that doesn't make sense. You don't – if somebody's far enough away that you can throw a potato at them, then you're sort of the aggressor in that situation. Nobody is – nobody's getting – out of the way of a door. Like, if you throw a potato at me, I'm bum-rushing you for sure. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no there's no version of throwing a potato at somebody that gets you out of being beaten. So it sounds a lot like she's the aggressor in that situation. And not to, uh, uh, to, to you know, extrapolate or victim blame or anything like that. But even of her own account, uh, she doesn't even claim anywhere nowhere in the documentary do they claim that her ex-husband was abusive there's just that one moment where she claims that she had to get out of the house and throw a potato at him so she's the aggressor in that situation so here were the big red flags for me and the whole uh carol murder situation and like i said it wasn't until she started talking that it all sort of seemed like she's the problem uh if you watch the documentary you realize that Carol has like 40 alibis. Don't get me wrong. Um, I've never murdered anybody. I've never been um, told that I was going to be murdered. I think if you live a good life, for the most part, you, there's not a lot of people going around that are trying to murder you. That That's honestly my murder plan, is that I'm a good dude, right? Like, I can't address... Whether or not a serial killer is gonna gonna find me uh, and kill me, I can't address whether or not a crazy person just for no reason is gonna shoot at me. But for the most part, I will not put myself in a situation with people in my life uh, where I'm doing them wrong, cheating on them, uh, doing horrible things, or hanging out with somebody who seems imbalanced in a violent way that could get me in a situation where I could end up murdered. So that's the first step to not getting murdered. Um, but the thing is, there's no body. There's no weapon. There's no motive. Yet it still looks like Carol killed this dude. But it, it like that's the perfect crime, is if they never find a body, they never find a weapon, they never find a motive. So Carol's whole life has been just cramming doubt into the scenario. So Carol, so Carol's big alibis is Don has Alzheimer's. She goes on the news and says he's he's running around Tampa. He might not know who he is. Uh, then she starts cramming in all this information about how Don used to fly planes, but he didn't really have a license, so he's been flying illegally for years. She's got this information about how he flies near the Gulf, uh, below radar level. She's talking about if they crashed, nobody would ever know. Um, she, she has an alibi. One of her alibis literally is that she couldn't have run him through the meat grinder. Like, like here's the thing. If you're accused of murder by a lot of people, you don't candidly and, and hypothetically and sarcastically respond to the ways that they thought you would have disposed of the body. She responds in detail about how she couldn't have uh, planted him underneath the septic tank because Carol, sorry, because uh, some other lady had moved into the place before that. She goes into detail about how her meat grinder specifically could not grind up a body. That's where you don't, you don't go that route if you're if you're not a murderer, if you're not interested in somebody saying that you murder somebody, you don't even like entertain the idea of how you would have gotten rid of the body. So she she says, look, Don could have done this. He could have done that. He could have done this. He, well, the last time I saw him, he had to leave early, early, early to go to Costa Rica where we know he had a, a mistress. Um, and then the other one was the night that he went disappearing, Carol somehow found herself wandering around uh, Tampa at 3 a.m. and getting herself in trouble and picked up by the police so that they had to drive her home, like basically on record. Um, that's a weird thing to have happen the day before your husband disappears is that you find the most uh, like credible person to be able to, to, and I say credible with a grain of salt, but, but from, the, from a court standpoint, if you bring a sheriff's deputy in to say that 
this person was with you on the night of the thing and it's her brother's friend so it's not a brother connection so there's no reason why this guy should lie should have to lie and she gets driven home by a deputy in the middle of the night the night he gets the night he disappears so she's doing this thing hey he must have alzheimer's he could be anywhere uh he could have crashed nobody would have known i just think he's straight up in costa rica i just think uh there's no way that i could have ran him through the meat grinder hey there's no way i could have uh, planted him underneath the septic tank um the whole thing is shady and like I said, I was on Carol's side until the moment that she started talking. Um, their entire marriage is weird. Uh, she's 20 years younger than him. As soon as they got married, they just started buying cougars uh, and breeding them and making these weird like cougar videos. Um, the things that they found of Don Lewis's were just like his briefcase and a, um, a van at the airport. All the details of the thing feel like if you were going to try to get away with a murder, this is what you would do. Uh, so that's the big thing. And then here's where it really got me. After his death, and I missed this the first time I watched, so go back and watch if you need to. After Don dies, um, his one of his assistants gets a call from Carol, and she has them go and break into the office, and then she goes and supposedly steals uh, Don's will and Don's power of attorney and then rewrites them with her as the executor. Now, I don't, there's no, the guy's a millionaire. He's got a lawyer. He's got an assistant. He's got all these people and they all claim that there was a, an original power of attorney. Just from a logical standpoint, you don't make your wife your power of attorney uh, for these types of things, especially if she's not involved in the businesses. So all this stuff goes missing. Carol puts all his property in her name. She ends up taking 90% of his assets. Um, she goes on on TV like, there's like five different interviews of her going on the Tampa News, like talking about how her husband's missing, about how he's, all, like she went over the top in a lot of ways. But the thing that really uh, clinched it for me was when I realized sort of at the end of the, the, the episode that they never had a funeral for him. So like that should be the first step is like the guy goes missing, have a funeral. She says this weird thing about how, uh, what did she say? I wrote it down. She, she says this weird thing about how she goes and gets, oh, she, when she gets the death certificate, she looked out the window. Next thing she knew, it was night. This is, they ask her directly, hey, did you ever have a funeral for Don? And she goes, no, the day I got the death certificate, which, by the way, is five years and one day after he goes missing, which legally means that there's no, like, a, I think a will has a five-year shelf life. So five years and one day after he goes missing, she has him pronounced dead uh, so that she can take all the assets. Um and then she goes, the day I got the death certificate, I looked out the window, and next thing I knew it was night. I totally zoned out, and that was the closest there was to a memorial. What kind of psychopath are you that you think that that's a memorial? Is that you, even if this happened, that you get a death certificate, you daydream for a little while, and then you come back to Earth, and then that was the funeral? Like, that's the craziest thing of the whole deal. No funeral. The way that I, the way that I uh, memorialized him was to look out the window for a little while. And then if somebody asks you about a death rumor and you start laughing, that's like, that's insane. That's an insane thing to do. Um, and supposedly uh, the family starts getting threatening letters from Carol. She's going to ruin their lives and if they keep doing interviews. Because they're all out doing interviews talking about what happened to this guy. Where is he? Where, we miss him as well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Carol basically never tells anybody any information that she has. So that's weird. Okay, I will say, like from, from, a, from a balanced standpoint, um, look, there's no physical evidence that, uh, that a murder happened, obviously. So, like, she's good there who, or whatever. Whatever happened, there's no physical evidence that a murder actually happened because uh, there's no body. There's no alibi. Or excuse me. There's no uh, motive. And there's no... Um, What's the other one I wanted? Uh, and there's no uh, murder weapon, right? You find a weapon with Don's blood on it, like obviously with this thing. So it's none of that. So then that's where they go into this big like, oh, it must have been the cats. The cats ate him. A tiger can eat through bones. A tiger's stomachs are very acidic. Um, that's the part that I really don't agree with or believe. Although if it turns out that that's what happened um, and, you know, whoever you believe in upstairs um, he knows what happened or she knows what happened. And um, if 
if you fed your husband to the tigers, that is that is the worst form of animal abuse I think I can think of. Uh, to feed like a, a dude who's probably uh, just covered in herpes and HPV to the tigers. I think that's fucked up. Um, but I will say this. Okay, so the people that they interviewed on the Don side literally are his ex-wife who like says he's a cheating piece of shit. Uh, his assistant, which, you know, whatever. I don't know. That's a business human. Uh, his lawyer, his mechanic, his handyman. So kind of in a way, they interview his daughters, but it's sort of they're on the estranged side of the family. So kind of in a way... There's nobody on the side of the interview that says Don is missing that actually would know. If Don wanted to go missing, go to Costa Rica and be with his, like, mistress that's Costa Rican, they didn't really get to the bottom of the people that they would have talked to. Because he already is a guy who... um, left one family so it's like it's a thing you could do back in the in the 80s and 90s there was no social media so if you didn't like your wife you just picked up and you moved to another town and pretty much no one would ever find you there was no find my iphone you just started a new family you know that's what find my iphone is find my iphone should just be called find my husband but so they don't interview anybody who really would have gotten to the bottom of it. Because if you are going to I don't know, leave, run away, become another person, I don't know. Uh, you could fake your death, I guess. Uh, you could. Uh, the more I say this, it actually, the more ridiculous it sounds. So pretty much Don would not have been a successful businessman, left all of his businesses that were not losing money uh, for a lady that doesn't matter. And then also if he left and then this lady started messing with all his paperwork he probably would resurface so it does go to logic that something happened to this man and that he's no longer around and that's the other thing so the detectives all the people that they interview about the the case uh basically says look there's no physical evidence uh there's no reason uh we have no suspects like there's no reason to think that anything like actually happened but the, the the details are very sketchy. Um, so the thing that I was going to say was, um, so the big thing from the police standpoint is, is there's no physical evidence to say that anything happened to this guy. So that's what makes it like a, a just a, just a looming mystery. And that's what's confusing about the whole thing is there's no other theories. There's no, like, there's no other people that are suspects. There's no other theories that anybody else could have. Like, they don't even present in the documentary at any point that anybody else would have been uh, involved in, like, murdering him. Like that's, like, that's the other way to go, right? You just, especially in, like, in the, in the South, you just present another possible murderer, and then you're kind of, they'll arrest that guy because they don't really feel like solving the crime, and then that's that. But in this case, there's just no, there's just no solve ever, which is weird. It's a weird, um, it's a weird circumstance. And it makes me feel like this happens way more than I think it does. I think probably there are people murdering their wives and husbands on a regular basis and being smart enough to not do it as a crime of passion. Really, I mean, if the media has showed us anything and Hollywood has shown us anything, it is pretty much if you plan it and it's the 90s, you can probably kill your loved ones and no one will ever know because there's not enough, uh, there's, no, there's no forensic evidence that really exists at the time. Uh, every every crime scene is a mess. They're not really doing their job of what they're supposed to do. Even in this case, they they, they found his van at the at the airport. No no record of a flight. They find his van at the airport, and they find his briefcase in the van. They go, okay, well, he obviously he, he must have flown off. No record of a flight. No reason to think that any of that happened, other than the fact that his van is there. Um, and then the big thing on this, the big the big mystery on the van thing, was that apparently they didn't look in the van for like five or six days, so anything could happen in the, in in the in the process in the middle of that. So all we got is a bunch of people saying, "Look, there's no reason why this guy would have bailed," um, and now he's missing. So what's the deal? Uh, and it is. It's hard. It's hard to watch this. It's hard. It's hard to look at Carol's face when she tells a story and think that what she's saying is true. And I think we all, a lot of us know people like this where it's like, look, it would be so easy for you to just tell us the truth. And maybe there is, maybe there is like a logical, um, intelligent response and situation that happened. Maybe there is something that's explainable. 
about the disappearance. Maybe she knows something, um, is embarrassed to say it, but any of those things, uh, if, if she was like human about it, would totally clear up the, the doubt for everybody. But I don't know. I just think if you have like 40 alibis, um, and you're doing all these weird shady business things at the end, then might, something might be up. And also like, Clearly, even from Carol's own account, she's a shady individual. She's going around and switching husbands. She's meeting up with dudes at gunpoint at 6 o'clock in the morning. So there's nothing great about the situation. I had to throw a potato across the kitchen to my ex-husband to, to get him away from me. Um, like, you know, just the fact that she's beating everything into the head. She does this whole, like, weird Alzheimer's thing. She goes, well, he was acting weird. He couldn't remember where he was. And then all of a sudden, one of our assistants came up to us and said that it looked like Alzheimer's to me. As if, like, some lady who works volunteer for Carol Baskin to work with tigers has any information about Alzheimer's and, it, and its symptoms and its, uh, and its cognitive functions and its neurology and... and uh, I want to say neuropathy. I don't think that's a word, but it makes me sound smart or dumb. Um, it's just, it, it's just strange. And then even in the interviews, there's this, there's this quote that sort of seems out of place where Carol's talking about it. Look, they see me as a threat to their livelihood and their ego. That's why they're talking shit about me. And honestly, I think that was more about probably the Doc Antles and the Joe Exotics and that sort of thing. But either way, Carol is a very villainous character. I'm not sure whether or not she's a murderer, but she is for sure a dishonest person. She is for sure somebody who you wouldn't really want to cross or fight. Uh, because if you start, if you watch the rest of the documentary and you binge the rest of it, you start to find out that Carol spends a lot of her time using money to uh, intimidate, uh, overcome, and like put other people out of business. Like the whole tail end of the documentary is just that Carol sues Joe and he can't afford it and then he's just like paying Carol on the side and letting his tigers go to waste so it's just the whole thing is is absurd in a way and uh, very speculative in a way uh, and very plausible in all of the ways because um, if you just if you look at it what I don't know I don't know what the other theory could be the other theory being that, that he didn't get murdered, then where is Don? And I guess I guess if he was, if he disappeared 20 years ago, they said, the documentary is about four years of, of, uh, of, of footage. So let's call it an even 24 years ago, this guy goes missing, right? So what's that put? That puts us into the mid-90s, uh, and he was in his 40s. So yeah, so he's still very much alive, even even if he's, he's in bad health. It's 35 years of him not having any interest in having his money, not any interest in talking to his family, not any interest in, like, in, in calling Carol Baskin a bitch or being on the documentary. Uh, it's just all very implausible. Although I will say, I, I, uh, I know a couple Costa Ricans, and I would, I would turn my life over and start a new uh, leaf for a Costa Rican in a second and you know who you are uh but so it's the whole thing is is absurd and um but if nothing else what we get from this episode is the type of person that Carol is Carol is a vindictive person a person who will throw a potato at somebody a person who will use money to intimidate people power to intimidate people doesn't really care uh, emotionally about anyone her her the only time we show her being emotional is at the time of disappearance on television, uh, saying that her husband might be lost and running around and he might not who, know who he is. The entire time that they're interviewing him, her about this dead husband, she's using it as a way to be sarcastic. There still feels like kind of a, um, an edge to the scenario. Um, then we meet her new husband, and he kind of feels like he's a dick towards the old husband, which just wouldn't be the case. There would be a supportive environment for Carol if she didn't know what happened to her husband and, uh, and she was worried about his whereabouts. Now, it is possible that he could have gone uh, missing and she hated him, right? And then so she was relieved that he went missing, but there's just no real evidence that states any of that type of stuff. So I just think her vibe about the whole thing makes us feel very much like she's involved in some way. Whether she's a murderer or not, we don't know. But she's involved in some way. And and I don't I really don't think 
I think the big thing right now is people are starting to say that what's happening is she is being framed in this way by the documentarians. If you watch his documentary, it's very hard to find a circumstance where it feels like they're taking advantage of Carol. It's one of these things. It's like uh, uh, as a comedian, I get offered reality shows all the time. And what happens is when you go on a reality show, the producer will basically give you like a sort of a plot point in a way. Or it's like you watch all these shows on Bravo and such and so forth. And what happens is they'll they'll, they'll present the thing. They'll, they'll, like the whole episode will be about how Ryan cheated or whatever. And then they'll ask you about that. The, the 90 Day Fiance, they'll go into the mother-in-law's house and they'll be like, look... Brian uh, doesn't pay for bills. What's going on? Do you believe in this as a Puerto Rican woman? And then she responds directly to that sort of thing. So a documentarian has that ability. And, and, and as an individual, you have the ability to not say things about yourself that make you look like an asshole, make you be embarrassed, make you look like you don't have a, a compassion for anybody. And make you look like a human being. And Carol, every time she gets interviewed over a course of four years, different backgrounds, different ages, other people, different people around, every time they interview her, she has this weird air of, of sort of arrogance, um, like snobbiness. Um, she thinks she's better than every person uh, in her field, uh, even... It doesn't believe in things that she is reportedly doing. Um, so there is, Carol is her own worst enemy in a lot of the ways. So even even if, even if Don Lewis shows up tomorrow after this documentary and says, look, I've been alive the whole time. I'm in Costa Rica. I'm crushing it. I got like six girlfriends. Um, even if that happens, Carol Baskin is still a bitch. Um, that's how I feel. And I think that's how a lot of us feel. And, and it is. It's hard, it's hard to find uh, a common ground with this lady, Carol. It is hard to try and understand her motivations in a lot of ways because she doesn't even... It's a, we don't, we're not sure what she believes in because even in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the initial moments of, of meeting Don, having access to this money, coming from a poor background, her family not caring about her, she says something about uh, a sexual assault and her family believes that it was her fault, these sorts of things, um, which I just don't know where that's coming up in the documentary that she needs to tell us uh, that she was sexually assaulted and that her family thought it was her fault. I just don't, I, I'm again, I'm not there. I'm not, I'm not there framing the questions, but I don't know what reason that needs to come up in a documentary about owning tigers. So the first thing that happens when she, when she marries Don Lewis, they buy like 50 tigers over three years and then they call their property a sanctuary and they spend a lot of their time, even to her, uh, admission, breeding these cubs and, but the entire rest of the documentary, she's sort of in this position that you shouldn't breed, uh, that I've only gotten animals that, that, that I've uh, adopted and taken out of horrible situations and I've rescued, that I have these 100 animals. It seems like she has closer to like 12. Um, so there's just a lot around Carol Baskin that is very shady and very different. Now, there's a lot of people that I know now live in Tampa. Uh, I have a, 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 a different podcast where I interview adult film uh uh, moguls, let's call them, and we don't talk about porn, but we we focus on that industry. And there's a there's a very vibrant fetish industry in Tampa. The podcast is called Porn Stars Are People. So a lot of my friends down in that area uh, are are very familiar with Carol Baskin and what goes on in that property. Um, and just like when you know that there's a backyard zoo nearby you, you have some information, you've heard some stories, and it doesn't seem like she even has a good name in the community. So not to say that Joe Exotic is is a saint or an angel, not to say that uh, Doc Antle has a good reputation, not to say that um, Jeff Lowe is a good dude, but what we know for sure from this documentary that it is very, very, very hard to be on Carol Baskin's side. Um, so suffice it to say, that bitch killed her husband. Um, but I don't know. Tell me your thoughts. Tell me what you think. Is, I, I would really, I have, I've been going through the memes. I've joined a bunch of the face, Facebook groups. I have yet to find anybody who particularly uh, 
feels positively about Carol Baskin. There is some weird stuff. There's this weird uh, conspiracy theory that Jeff Lowe is her ex-husband. We don't have any interviews of her ex-husband, with her ex-husband, anything like that. Obviously, the Jeff Lowe thing is probably not true. We would know if he was her ex-husband. That would be one of the first things he would tell somebody, probably, um, in, in the situation where they're trying to, to like make her be a bad person. Look, I know firsthand she's a terrible person. I was her husband. Um, she threw a potato at me, you know. Um, so I don't think that one's true. But there's a lot of other weird stuff sort of around Carol, and it doesn't feel like anybody's on her side. And I don't think um, – I just there's no Carol Baskin support group Facebook page. That's all I'm saying. Um, and we can do whatever we want with saying that documentarians frame people in a, in a negative way. But if that's true – I mean, there are plenty of people from literature who are villains that we kind of have some sympathy and empathy for. And – Carol's not one of them. Uh, I think the big takeaway in this whole thing is that Carol is probably a bad person. And if she, the thing is, if she did murder her husband, she has no remorse. And if she did murder her husband, I we I think we all think she's capable of it. Um, but again, no body, no motive, no weapon, no proof, no physical evidence. Uh, so... With that being said, Don Lewis is just uh, a ghost. So uh, this is the Tiger Crisis Podcast. Put out a new episode every Thursday. Check us out on all the places, iTunes, Google Play. Uh, get involved in the conversation. I want to hear what you guys think about uh, the documentary. So far, it's just me in my, um, in my coronavirus quarantine brain thinking about all these sort of things. Uh, so I'd love your opinion. I love your perspective. Let me know what's going on in your head. Let me know what you think about the thing. If there are Carol Baskin supporters, please tell me. I want to hear. I want to hear that side of it. Uh, I would love to uh, to be in that in that discussion. I would hate to have this whole documentary happen. And then people think that the whole thing is sort of like woman bashing, woman hating. Because it's not. It's not woman bashing. It's not woman hating. It's Carol Baskin hating. Let's say that. Because there's a lot of ugly and gross dudes in the thing, too. There's a lot of sexism happening in this entire documentary. Um, and I think we need to look at that right now uh, as a reflection of society. That is South Carolina. That is Florida. That is Oklahoma that we're looking at for the most part. There's a little bit, I think, of, uh, of Ohio there. And then people that want to live in Vegas. And there's a lot of sexism, weird stuff going on. Uh, there's no black people in the thing. There's a lot going on. And it's it's these uh, very crucial red states that are involved in this documentary. That's all I'm saying. Uh, so let's get the discussions rocking. Thank you guys for listening and watching. Uh, there's some YouTube content. We're on Google Play, Apple, iTunes, Anchor app, uh, and where every pat podcast is. Thank you for listening and watching. We had a meat grinder. If you've ever seen a Butcher Boy meat grinder, it's about that big around. That became like this wholly exciting thing that I ran him through that grinder. And it's like... I couldn't have run his hand through the grinder, much less a body.